Hi, welcome to everyone's favourite segment, Mailbag. I don't actually have too many on the shelf compared to uh, the backlogs I've had recently. So this won't be like 20 items or something. So it might actually be a bit shorter. Anyway, let's get straight into it. Thank you very much, uh, Antri uh, Anthony uh, Fitzpatrick. He's from uh, Western Australia, WA. So hi to all my Western Australian viewers. Let's have a look. We got ourselves a hard case. Whoa, tech tools, Tektronics, huh? Huh? Let's have a look. Here we go. Come on, there's a note. Ooh, okay. Here we go. Whoa, oh, oh, it's one of those, yep. The uh, sponge has completely deteriorated. Oh, yep. Oh, anyway, what is this? I have not seen this before. It's a Tech RFM 90 Signal Mini. Beauty. Check it out. Techtronics RFM 90 Signal Mini. It's an RF uh, TV antenna. Uh, signal strength meter basically check it out made in Spain hi to all my Spanish viewers uh, Does this mean that it's actually not a bit of Tektronix kit and they've just uh, rebadged it from someone else? I think that's uh, very likely anyway, um, I can't really find much info on this thing, I got the uh, specs from an eBay ad. So there was some press release on Tektronix's website, but you had to log in or some bullshit like that. I don't know, but uh, anyway, yeah, I think it could be a uh, rebadger, I suspect. This is interesting. It actually uses a Nokia Mobira Cityman 100 mobile phone battery or cellular phone. Um, that's rather interesting. Hmm, they actually designed it around an existing mobile phone battery. Well, not a bad idea, actually. Anyway, so the whole idea is that you go to somebody's house with this and they've got uh, TV problems, you plug it in to the antenna. You might even go up on the roof and plug it uh, directly in so you get as little uh, loss as possible, a little cable loss as possible, and uh, you tune in the channels you want and it will tell you the RF uh, signal strength. And, uh, you know, there'd be uh, standards for that, of course, what, what are uh, uh, sort of minimum signals or a decent signal strength required to get reasonable footage in a particular area. But it's all changed now. This this was back in the old uh, analog uh, days and got headphones here to decodes the audio you can probably listen to it all right so let's crack this thing open very quickly a little uh, uh, belt clip uh, came off there and ta -da! we're in like Flynn check it out do we have any uh, manufacturer markings because I don't think this is a bit of Tektronics kit Bingo, we found the manufacturer, Promax, um, PRX 004, 004A, that doesn't uh, register or anything on Google, so yeah, but Promax, definitely uh, the original manufacturers of these things. Very interesting construction, how they've done this uh, charging connector on the bottom, or interface connector, whatever it is, it's like, it's got a separate board down in there, and it's... They've soldered along here to make the contacts. I don't get it. They've done it for strength uh, reasons, I would suggest. But, um, yeah, that's it's rather interesting. Anyway, they've got the... Why not just mount it directly on the board and have it a right-angle connector and have the physical... Um, and, and rely on the physical mounts on the connector? I don't get it. Anyway, um, very interesting. We've got ourselves some uh, big-ass-looking... Relays there, check those puppies out. Are they RF relays? No, they wouldn't be on the top board. No, they're just a Joe Bloggs uh, small signal relay, which is, uh, it's doing a lot of switching though. Very interesting construction, how this is all packaged together and uh, even the relays, they're on their own little board going off here and uh, look, they're shielded on the bottom. So they're obviously doing some important signal switching but no hang on i stand corrected <laughs> that's where that look that's the uh, antenna connector there so they're actually using that as an antenna switching relay so that's interesting um and yeah well it's a, what different uh, attenuation ranges for the input antenna uh, input perhaps anyway there's the input there's the output going in our rf can 
Oh, I know you RF aficionados want to see inside the can. You always do. Look at that. Oh, we've got ourselves some little coils. They're not uh, uh, waxed down at all to hold them in place. Hang on. There's a big fat ROM here, but uh, where's the micro? Is it a ROM? I think that could be a pre-programmed micro. It must be, because there's nothing else there that I can see. So let's peel the label off. And if we lift the kilt on this thing, here we go, 60, um, ST6225. And that is a massively obsolete 8-bit uh, uh, mass ROM micro. Actually, the day code on that is 99, so there you go. That's, that's in 1999. We're going to party like it's 1999. Um, so this is oh, it's a relatively modern in the scheme of things, but the design is probably ancient, and this probably had like a 10-year product lifespan or something like that. So it wouldn't surprise me if this was developed in the late 80s or uh, early uh, 90s. So anyway, thank you very much, Anthony. That was more than a two-minute teardown. RF signal strength meter. Cool. Next up, we have one from the United States of America, Robert uh, Frank... Uh, yeah, I'm not going to try and pronounce it. Uh, from Lancaster, California. I don't think I've heard of Lancaster, California before. I don't all my Californian viewers. Love California. It's probably the closest uh, thing America's got to Australia, like in terms of... Um, weather, culture, especially San Fran. Um, San Fran's actually a sister city, if you didn't know. Anyway, um, oh, oh, we've got documentation. <laughs> it is, ta-da, an Emerson um, compact C uh, CD clock radio thingamabob. Two minute teardown. Now this thing, this Emerson uh, stereo clock radio CD player, wake to your favourite CD track. <laughs> neat. I'm sure that was neat back in the day. Anyway, um, uh, this is interesting. Robert says it, it's a very he's, says it's a haunted radio. Of course, there is no such thing as haunted bullshit. There's just engineering. It has developed an interesting, unique file. It's become an FM transmitter. I guess it got tired of just receiving. It transmits a weird signal around 95.1 meg right after being plugged in, uh, including two pictures of the spectrum um, captured with his uh, software-defined uh, radio and, uh, and <laughs> recorded audio with very weak waveform. Anyway, it's spooky. There you go. Thank you very much, Robert. And sure enough, here's the spectrum, 95.1 megahertz, and it's transmitting something. So what's going on there, I would suspect, is that the, uh, uh, that would be the local oscillator, of course, um, plus the IF uh, frequency, 455 kilohertz. Usually that's the audio tone. What else have we got there? Yeah, we've got ourselves a spectrum. Oh, that's the audio uh, spectrum. So yes, that would be my guess, is that the local oscillator, I don't know why it's transmitting um, some fire inside, I'm not exactly sure, but they, it must have a local oscillator in there. Um, local oscillator plus the IF, so I, that would be, that would be my guess. Anyway, 2002 vintage. And sure enough, check it out. I've just got the uh, input to the spectrum analyzer here, uh, just uh, <laughs> intertwined with the antenna, the FM antenna on this thing. And sure enough, look at that. That is huge. That's minus uh, 20 dBm at uh, 95.5 meg or thereabouts. Wow, it's jumping around like a jackrabbit too. And there's a 100 megahertz span on the puppy. Wow, that is... <laughs> That is terrible. <laughs> What's going on there? Anyone got any thoughts? I I don't think it's like, yeah, we're not going to see anything interesting in a two-minute teardown, but that is fascinating. If anyone's ever seen a failure mode like that in an FM radio, let us know, because sure enough, that thing is damn well transmitted at quite a reasonable power. All right, you know I couldn't resist. Two-minute teardown. Um, it's typical uh, construction that you'd find in something like this. Uh, Single-sided PCB, of course. They've got a uh, Toshiba. That'd be a Toshiba uh, tuner in there. And, well, no, actually, that'd be a Toshiba, that'd be a Toshiba amp. Um, your tuner's going to be around here. There's all the wax I was talking about uh, 
before for the uh, coils. There's our AM um, receiver uh, ferrite rod. And oh, it's just hanging off the end there, a bit loosey-goosey. Um, and yeah, the trouble's going to be in there somewhere. I don't know what, but uh, hmm... There's basically uh, bugger all in the rest of it. Got a regular uh, trenny in there to power the thing. And the CD mechanism's just, you know, it's just bugger all, really. Um, geez, they put that on a vibration mount. I'm surprised in such a cheap-ass thing. But, um, yeah, obviously, <laughs> it was either absolutely required to make it work or uh, they gilded the lily just a tad. There's actually a lot of parts that go into a... Uh, little bedside clock radio like this thing but they churn them out you know cheap as uh chips in china but yeah anyway if anyone's got any clue about how this is uh turned into a, a pretty crappy transmitter at the uh presumably at the it's the local oscillator doing it uh please let us know and for those playing along at home there is the toshiba part number i'll try and link in a data sheet if i can Hi to all my Norwegian viewers, in particular, uh, Gerhard Justelsen from, um, yeah, Norway. Um, fantastic, we don't get too many from Norway. So let's crack this one open and see what we've got. It's another, spoiler alert, another broken electronics. Broken electronics usually means two minute teardown. in an RS components box. Do they have RS components in Norway? Um, for it yet? Yeah, two minute teardown. Cool. Alright. Double wrapped for our protection. Red. Red. Red what? Guess I should read the note. It's a battery charger used for first or second generation professional red digital Cinema cameras, yes, um, very expensive stuff. I thought it might be interesting to see the design decisions in the fire. Oh, okay, I like, yeah, what like a portable field thing because it's got carry handle on it, and presumably, ah, yeah, right, you plug the red battery on the back. Sorry, I'm not, I've never played with a red camera. Presumably, it's got a massive ass battery pack. It looks big, and you plug it in there, and it, oh, oh, two of them. You can have one either side. All right. Interesting. Two minute teardown. Two minute teardown on this red lithium ion battery charger. Not going to be a huge amount in it. Um, in fact, I don't even see temperature sensing, but it's obviously done inside the cell. Look at the moldy contacts down in there. So, meh, it'll just have a power supply and a lithium ion uh, charger chip in it. Just one of the many off the shelf charger chips would be my guess. Anyway, it is mains powered, so it's crap. Oh! It's, it's, it already, it's already open! It's already open! Ah, oh, Already had a crack at it! There we go! And, whoop, I can see lots of big current shunt resistors down in there! Hardware, okay! <laughs> Someone's tested it, okay, the hardware is okay! Uh, electrolytic cap there, you can actually see the... That's not a solid uh, electrolyte in there, because you can see the uh, pressure vent mark on there hopefully you can see that on the camera anyway a couple of relays down there for switching what's their chipset oh that's intelligent looks like it's got a micro down in there another bunch of uh current shunt resistors down in there and well that looks quite reasonable it's got the requisite got some protection and filtering on the input there's our main rectifier cap what brand and we're looking at uh, the big M there, Matsushita, so a uh, Panasonic Caps, good brand, and what else have we got on the up? Oh, nothing on the underside. Oh, those joints look pretty, how you doing? Look at those. Wow. Dry as a dead dingo's donger. I'm going to have to get in there under the microscope, but uh, yeah, is that like just the lead-free bullshit but I don't know it looks pretty crusty or is it just the flux maybe I could clean it up and it might look a bit better but yeah I <laughs> doesn't instill a lot of confidence really oopsie check out the bodgy little transformer tap coming off there wow that's it's <laughs> a bit how you do it as well we've got ourselves a pick 18f series for all you pick fanboys and uh 
I went, like, are they using that to do the custom controlling? I would have expected just an off-the-shelf lithium-ion charger I see this. So this is much more advanced than what I expected. Let me tell you, and there's lots of current shunt resistors everywhere. Well, nope, I don't see any other dedicated uh, li traditional lithium-ion off-the-shelf charger chip on there. So there are, there, it looks like they're doing it. They custom implemented it in the pick. Wow, that is fascinating. They've really gilded the lily in terms of the engineering required to uh, charge a lithium-ion battery. I mean, these off-the-shelf chips, you could have just had a power supply, an off-the-shelf chip, which handles everything, and Bob's your uncle. But no, all these current sense resistors are all doing stuff, lots of protection, uh, and yeah, they really seem to be charging this very cautiously. And I can only presume that this big uh, Dale 5-watt resistor here is for uh, discharging the battery as well. So maybe they get some, uh, you know, charge characterization, uh, charge discharge cycles that can characterize, um, you know, how much uh, capacity is left in the battery and stuff like that would be my guess. Anyway, that's interesting. That's inside a red battery, uh, lithium ion battery charger. Much more complicated than you'd expect. Another one from the United States of America from uh, Tempe, Arizona. Hi to all my viewers in Tempe, or just Arizona in particular. Um, I've been to Arizona, been to Meteor Crater in Arizona. Didn't quite get to um, uh, Winslow though. <laughs> anyway, um, ooh, what have we got here? Oh, look at, oh, look at that. Oh, oh look at the cut. Mm of the case. Jeez, this is... What? Okay. So that's a charger thing, eh? That's a cigarette lighter. What? Auto shaver, it says. I guess it is an auto shaver. Wow. This, oh, this thing is ancient. What? I've got a little... What on earth is this dog doing? Better read the note. John is an EE student from Phoenix, Arizona. Hi to all my uh, viewers in Phoenix. Uh, big fan of your channel, particularly Mailbag. Everyone loves it. It's everyone's favourite segment. <laughs> After seeing all the cool and crazy stuff, he thought he'd send in some cool and crazy stuff. Anyway, this second item is an Arlec Tripup. Um, it, it's a porcelain electrical splitter manufactured in the 1930s. What? It is. Look. It's just, a, it's a, like basically a double adapter, as we'd call it here, um, or a triple adapter. And uh, one of them's a bit loosey-goosey, but the Arlec Tripup. I, the, there you go. I mean, it's for all you trademark registered, Arlec Tripup. Um, for all you uh, history buffs, all you collectors out there, wow. <laughs> And this is a Trav Electric Auto Shaver Charger. It's designed to operate between 12 and 14.5 volts. There you go. <laughs> For service, see any radio repairman. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> anyway, isn't that a funky case for it? There's the output. Let's crack it open. Wow, check it out. It's a mechanical vibrator look at that mechanical vibrator inverter designed to generate 120 volts uh that american uh, rubbish out of course there's a one mfd none of this micro none of this micro mu symbol rubbish good old mfd yes one mfd for all you uh non-old school people is uh one microfarad that's how they used to uh write microfarad back in the day anyway it's a mechanical vibrator that uh steps up the 12 volts uh, converts the 12 volts dc from the car battery into 120 volts AC, pretty crusty, from the mechanical vibrator. <laughs> terrific. <laughs> That's terrific. It's so loud. If you want to see, I'll, I'll get my high-speed uh, camera on this, a 1,000 frames per second. So if you want to see this in a 1,000 frames per second, um, click here, hopefully, um, and go over to my EEV Vlog 2 channel, and I'll show you. Thank you very much, Colby Newman from Parts Unknown in the United States. Sounds like a wrestler <laughs> from Parts Unknown. And we have ourselves a four banger. Let's check it out.
This is the APF Mark 25 memory with wood paneling. Look at that <laughs> imitation wood paneling. Four banger calculator. Oh goodness, it turns on, but um, yeah, it doesn't seem to be doing that well. Hmm, one sick puppy. Made in the United States of America, 1975. Yup. Where's the nipple? I want to play with the nipple. There it is, down there. Ooh, love the nipple. There's something that's sadly lacking these days, a diagram of the actual chip, the physical orientation of it on the silk screen. Bloody ripper. We've got one from the old dart from KNIVD. K-N-I-V capital D. Hatton Garden. Anyway, um, I know all my Pommy viewers. Let's have a look. We do like PCBs, and looks like we have some proto boards. Let's check them out. We have yet another prototyping board, but this one's substantially more than meets the eye here. This is the router board by Nivdi. I did, yeah, I don't know how to pronounce that. Anyway, um, look, they're individual. Uh, it's like a matrix board, okay, but then it has these individual traces coming off. They're not actually going anywhere. You have to bridge them over with a, with, um, a solder, and then you can actually connect these kind of like an FP... So think of it like an FPGA matrix kind of, you know, cell kind of matrix. So this one can go to the one next to it if it wants, or can go to one there, but it can also go diagonally as well. So you can actually join up pins diagonally like that. And it's it's rather fascinating. How good it is in practice, I don't know. I'd have to actually try you. I'd have to save that uh, for a different uh, video. But not only is it interesting from that respect, yes, it's registered, trademark, and blah, 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 all that sort of uh, jazz, but it's, and it's also a Kickstarter as well, and, uh, well, you can actually buy it, I think the Kickstarter's over. The other interesting thing is, if it comes with its own router board description language, you can actually use a language to actually design your routes on here, and it comes with this awesome looking visual editing software that you can uh, presumably uh, do the programming language in, import and export, and then manually tweak it, and things like that in the software. It's A for effort on this one. Um, whether or not it, you know, is really useful in practice, as I said, I don't know, but it's probably the most interesting proto board we've seen to date. I'll link it in down below. Check it out. I'll tell you what though, there's one thing I absolutely hate is the black solder mask. Maybe if I hold it up like this, I don't know, I've got my, can't see it very good on the camcorder LCD, but you can see the traces going up there diagonally, just, you can see them going over, but the black solder mask just, uh, it's just, it's frustrating, you can't see the traces underneath, don't like it. I know all my Swedish viewers, uh, Caroli Simon, I'm assuming it's back to front, may not be, um, Simon Caroli, Caroli Simon, thank you very much from... Uh, Lens Krona or something in Sweden. Cool. All right. It's oh, well, that didn't work. Actually, I think there might be something there. That's why it didn't work. Okay. Yep. There we go. Got a little dongle. Integri fuse. Oh, is it a little USB fuse inline electronic fuse? Let's check it out. And this is the Integri Fuse, a USB dual protection device that makes it possible to enable disable data comms, which can be used to protect private data when charging a phone tablet. If you're paranoid about that sort of stuff, Big Brother is watching, remember that. Um, also, a, they're not only watching, but they're logging everything. Also, a uh, power fuse function is implemented, five current threshold levels to choose between, and there is, like you might think, well, okay, how does it work? Okay, there's our symbols. And there's our little table on the back, and presumably, is that number of flashes? I don't know, one, two, anyway. Um, it does have a teeny, weeny, itty bitty switch on the side. Well, I'll tell you what, I can't make heads or tails of the mode thing here. Um, it's, I think I maybe set something, but I don't, yeah, get it, maybe, I don't know. 
Maybe I need to RTFM or something. Anyway, I looked at the Indiegogo campaign. There's like 15 days left, but it says that, uh, like, there's no description anymore. It's got a joke video and um, just saying it's not possible to order it anymore. So I don't know what the hell's going on with this project. Anyway, I'll link it in down below. Actually, there are quite a few ones here. This one's been sitting here for ages. Um, sorry to um, uh, um, somebody in the UK. Um, but yeah, I haven't opened this one. Let's have a look. It is an orange pie one because, yes, um, I complained quite some time ago before I got my orange pie ones that I couldn't get it. I was having problems getting it on AliExpress. They sent me one. Thank you very much, Brian Dory, um, and has also sent some stuff they sell on their website, abelectronics.co.uk. Let's check them out. And Brian from uh, abelectronics.co.uk um, does these uh, prototyping boards. Here's a Raspberry Pi prototyping board. It's got one of those extender um, headers with it. Um, yep, we've got, what's that, a little extender header? Not sure what's going on there. Anyway, um, a breakout uh, Raspberry Pi Zero uh, board and other little headers and things like that. So I'll link them in down below. They've got a Raspberry Pi 2 GPIO port and thanks for the orange pie. I'll add it to my cluster. Oops, sorry, I opened this one uh, off camera. I've had this for quite some time. I thought it was like a double delivery or something because we've seen this before. It's a Digilent Analog Discovery 2 and we've seen that before but I just remembered the previous one. So that was like the National Instruments branded version of the Analog Discovery 2. This is the Digilent branded one but they didn't just send that. They sent the uh, some of those power bricks that we've uh, seen before. Those little uh, breadboard power bricks. They're very cool. So they come in handy. We've got a PMOD A measure your circuit's impedance over an I2C interface. That could be interesting, so I'll take a quick look at that, uh, the interface board, and this is, they've got like an analog, a DigiLent analog parts kit. That looks pretty good. Got a smallish bread, oh, a long, thin breadboard. Okay, it hasn't got the top strips on it, and a whole bunch of parts. That could be really useful. Now this is actually really cool. For 65 bucks you can get this Digilent analog parts kit and here's all the stuff in it for those playing along at home. They've got uh, instrumentation amps, they've got uh, you know precision op amps, they've got voltage reference, AD584, they've got uh, magnetic field sensors, current shunt monitors, accelerometers, microphone, IR transmitter, uh, piezo, uh, temperature sensor, all sorts of fantastic stuff. So let's take a quick squiz inside this puppy and look at this beautiful um yeah that's not that's anti-static that's not conductive so that's not the best way to store those anyway i've done a whole video on that hmm <laughs> anyway we've got uh, these like uh, regulators down in there or transistors i'm not sure you get some leds caps uh electros resistors and a, a partial breadboard doesn't have the uh, power strips uh, top and bottom, and all the um, a lot of the chips on uh, surface in, in surface mount packages like the accelerometer, for example. I'm not sure if that that maybe looks like an accelerometer there. That looks like a microphone. Is it? Is it mounted on the bottom? It's got a hole in it. Hmm. I don't know. Anyway, um, SMD parts, and they've put those already populated onto the um, SMD to dip converter and you get one of these funky um digilent slash national instruments um screwdrivers which are very very handy and oh i've got ourselves a big power resistor look at that 6.2 ohms thank you very much and a whole bunch of jumper wires that is a neat kit i really really like that i'll link it in down below if you want to nab it Tell you what, I really like the idea of this. Measure your circuit's impedance over an I2C interface. And it uses um, a real funky chip, the analog device is AD5933. Not only, it's an it's an impedance converter. Not only uh, does it contain uh, the 12-bit, uh, uh, one meg sample, 12-bit ADC, but it's got a DDS signal generator in there and, and DSP uh, processing, which does um, the uh, Fourier transforms and every, it's, 
It is beautiful. I'm really, really interested in this chip. I might have to do a uh, project on that. It's very cool. Anyway, um, it's all integrated. It's one little board. I won't, you know, it's, yeah, the board itself. It's basically the analog device's chip on a board. Comes with uh, some cables and you can um, measure complex impedances from 100 ohms to 10 meg with the discrete, discrete Fourier transform DFT performed in the analog device's chip. Neat. Linked down below. On these rails. And there it is. There's the other one. There's a slave version. There's several ways to design an LCR meter, but the technique I chose for this is the voltage and current measurement technique. Basically, you uh, feed a fixed uh, frequency into the device under test and you measure the voltage and the current and the phases and from that from those basic measurements you can calculate everything and stick with me with it here but here's the technique